conflicting opinions. Can we start, Gimu? Yes, yes. yes. Where do we get up to? Third paragraph, right? Yeah, the opposite applies as well. When a person does an action or speaks words or has thoughts that are not good, then he is damaging. Uh, then he's damaging some a number of powers or energies and worlds, higher worlds. Damaging the kedusha, lein erech v'shu, without any measure. Kamoshenema, like it says, mar saich umachari vaich mimech yetzeu, that your destroyers and your desolators or whatever destroyers and uh, what those who destroy you will come out of you. In other words, you, the source of your own, the source of your own destruction, right, is from with you, from within you. That's, that's, by the way, the secret of why the enemies of the Jewish people are always preceded or caused by our own. No, it's, only, it's the internal weakness that we have, which is always reflected by the attack that comes from without. It is reducing, it darkens or reduces the light and the Kedusha. And it is adding power, on the other hand, in the worlds of... Um, Tuma, right? It is uh, adding power to the negative, to the negative side. That is what happens when you are doing things that are bad. They're creating, they're adding to the negative energy in the world. In other words, he's saying here that he's saying here he's, he's, he's developing the idea that when you do something wrong, or when you do something right, any action, any action, thought, or thought, any action, speech, or thought, down here is affecting the sherish of that thing. It's going up into the source in the higher worlds, and it is bringing down, it is affecting that source and bringing down more kedusha from that source. If you do something that you shouldn't do, or think or speak thoughts or words that should not be done, then you are causing damage. Now he's going to explain later what sort of damage, what sort of damage actions do, what sort of action, what sort of damage words do, what sort of action thoughts do. Each of them has got its own particular unique extreme form of damage and it's got aspects that are less serious than others. Each one has its own uniqueness and he's going to explain in more detail how the mechanism works. However, let's try to complete what you have reminded me that we said we would try to complete today. Let's first try and relate to that, which is we began to discuss how the actions of a person or thoughts, speech of a person are going up to the sherish and affecting changes. <coughs> the example that we looked at last time was the idea of how Torah, if you remember, is causative in the world. In other words, a right, just like Torah precedes the world, and it is the, it's the model or the program that runs, that builds the world, and also the oral law. Do you remember this discussion? Anyone out there? Okay. <laughs> the oral law, right? The opinions of the sages, even an opinion of, it, of somebody that represents Torah Shabbat Peh, since his opinion is Torah, that's exactly what Torah is, it is the hearts and minds of the sages of the Jewish people. <coughs> so then such an individual is going to be causative or formative in the world. His attitude will have a formative, formative effect in the world. Now we raise the problem which you promised to deal with. You don't have a seat? The problem that we raised, right, was the question of how there could be two opinions if we say that in Torah an opinion is causative or formative. Then the problem is, how can you have machlekes? How can you have two opinions which are mutually exclusive and then we say that they both have an absolute causative effect? Or put more simply, how can you have two mutually exclusive opinions in Torah and we say they're both right? So let's try to deal with this before we move on in the text. I know some people here have uh, objected to... that I want to hear shmuz and they want to learn the text. So I'm simply going to complete this issue because we did say we would deal with it and then we'll try to move ahead in the, in the safe. But let's try and complete this fundamental. One simple way out of this that you can use on certain occasions, I think we referred to last time, we discussed the problem of the man who had a lung problem and the Chazanesh told him, right, to leave, not to leave Eretz Israel. You remember this? In other words, in two different jurisdictions, 
it could be the two different opinions. In 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 uh, Nardo and Pumpadisa, you could have two opinions of Rav and Shmuel, and each one will be causative and normative for their place. However, what happens when two people argue in the same on the same matter in the same place? How do we say that they're both true? Right. First of all, Rav Asman told us that there are occasions when we do not have to say they're both true. There are very, very rare occasions where we say that one is objectively wrong. And there's only one case when that happens. And that is when you have a machlekes, let's say Amaraim, two Amaraim in the Gemara argue, and both are raising an opinion in the name of their Rebbe, and both claim that they heard it from him on the same occasion. In other words, if two Amaraim argue and they say one holds mut and one holds asu, okay, so we'll try and understand today how they could both be true. But if they both say that they heard this opinion from the Rebbe, Right, they're both quoting somebody. And he says he said yes, and he says he said no. Even then we usually say that one heard it at one time in his life, and another one heard it later. And he changed his mind. Poiskim changed their minds, right? <coughs> For example, I mean the Chavetz Chaim even. Chavetz Chaim writes in the Mishnah Bura that we make an alamichia for, we rake Bereim in Amazonas for dessert, that's cake. And later in his life he said we don't. And the prevailing practice today is that for, for dessert of cake or something like that, and, uh, except for certain rare exceptions, we don't say, we don't make a bracha. We make a bracha for fruit or for ice cream or something, we don't make a, fr- a bracha for... He changed his mind. Circumstances changed, custom changed, whatever, right? Um, sometimes a Tano on Amari would say something in learning and he would pass on a thing in a case that came before him differently. He would say a certain thing else learning. In other words, he learned up the issue. But when it came a case in front of him, he could rule differently. Rav Asman said, in oh, those situations, by the way, we accept La Locha, the one that he ruled in a case. Not the one that he said in learning. Why? Because when a case came before him, it squeezed him to a greater extent. Rav Asman said it squeezed his brains. In other words, a person has to rule in a given case where there's a practical matter that has to be ruled in real life. It's more pressure... Right? Some say there's more to the Shmai also, to approximate the truth because there's a case that demands a ruling as opposed to a theoretical learning up of how the situation would be. So if you ever have to choose between those two opinions, we'll choose the one that's thick. However, what happens if two Amoraim come and they say they heard the Rebbe say something on the same occasion? He didn't change his mind. They walked out of the same shear, and the one said, you see, he said it's okay. And the other one said, what do you mean? He said it's not. In that occasion, right... On that, that solitary example, we say that one is misquoting the Rebbe. Now, he's not misquoting without reason. He's got incredibly good reason to base, on which to base his particular opinion and why he heard, why he heard what he heard. And I'm not making a crude and gross mistake. <laughs> However, only one is saying, in fact, what he said. And one, even in the case in the Gemara where two Amorim argue, and one of them takes an oath. One of them takes an oath on what the Rebbe said. Takes an oath on what he said. Right? Which means, I mean... And, and, and he's wrong. And the Gemara says that if not for certain conditions, he would have transgressed making a false oath. I mean, that's a whole discussion. However, we want to talk about a deeper, a deeper perspective here. So please, stay with me carefully. What happens when two people have an opinion? Two, two Gedolim, two Tanoim, two have an opinion. And they are mutually exclusive. How do we say, Elu ba'elu divre lekim chaim? How do we say these and those are both Hashem's words? That they're both right. How do you say that? Especially when the two opinions are mutually exclusive. Now, the case that I'm thinking of, the classic exposition of this, somebody wrote to Rav Hutner and asked him this question. And in fact, the person who wrote to Rav Hutner asked him a question about an argument in the Gemara, not only about mutually, mutually exclusive opinions, but where the, where the opinion that is being discussed is factual. Factual. If two people have two different opinions, where opinions are valid, two experts can differ on how a thing should be done, can have two opinions. But when they have two different opinions about a fact, the machlekes that he questioned of Hutner about was an argument to the Gemara about the size of the crushing of the Mishkan, the boards that formed the sideboards of the tabernacle of the sanctuary of the Mishkan. There's an argument in the Gemara about what the size was. Now, they were only one size. It's not a matter of opinion. They were only one size. And there's one shitter that says they were like this, and one says they were like that, and we say they're both true. Yeah, what's going on? Are you with me? It's one thing saying, you know, a question of judgment in the grey zone, you know, where you have to make judgments. But you don't have to make judgments. You're talking about a fact. The Mishkan was a physical structure, and it had a certain dimension. 
And if one says the dimensions were like this, another one says they were like that, and they, if that isn't mutually exclusive, I don't know what is. How do we possibly say, Eluva Elu Divrim Kim Chayim, they're both right? What does that mean? That's the question that he was faced with. There's a fundamental thing to understand in learning. There are many examples of this, by the way. I can think of another one. There's Machlokes Tanoim in Shabbos <laughs> about what the tzitz looked like. You know, the Kohen Godel where it sits. You know, the, the head bed, right? And on it were the two words, Kodesh Lashem. There's a Machlokes there in the Gemara, whether it said Kodesh Lashem like this, Kodesh Lashem, horizontally, or Kodesh Lashem, written right one above the other, or slightly separated, but one above the other with Hashem's name on top. Were they written horizontally or vertically, basically? They are two opinions. The tzitz was the only one. The Aaron Akoen wore tzitz. You know, it didn't, it didn't shimmer between two, it didn't oscillate between two realities. It wasn't a quantum mechanical tzitz. You know, it was a physical thing, you know. What status did it have? Not only that, but what's even more perplexing is the Gemara says that Rebbe Yezer went to Rome and he saw it. You know, in the Vatican they have certain, certain things from the Basel Mikdash. Rebbe Yezer went to Rome and he saw it. And it didn't affect the argument. And now, what's going on? If he went to Rome and he came back, all well, they should have run up to Rebbe and said, which one of us is right? And he should have said, well, I saw it. It's like this. It's completely his... He, what he saw and witnessed is completely irrelevant to the discussion. The argument continues even though he saw the fact. What is going on? Maybe it's, only, maybe it's only visible to the um, subjective <laughs> viewer. That's a nice mystical answer, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, so let's understand. Let's understand. Let's understand. The first mistake here... Okay, the first mistake is to understand that they're arguing about the facts. That's called the Machlokis and Metzias. They're arguing about the size of the Krashim of the Mishkan, right? What was the fact, the historical, archaeological, if you like, fact? The Talmud does not argue about facts. We do not have Machlokis and Metzias. There are certain exceptions that appear to be exceptions, etc. But the general principle is there's no Machlokis and Metzias. They do not argue about fact. Anytime you come across an argument in the Talmud that appears to be about medical facts or biological facts or or, uh, or um, you know, certain, certain historical facts, you're making a big mistake. The Gemara does not argue. They do not argue in facts. They're not interested in facts. Listen carefully. The answer to the question is this. When there's a machlekes about a particular thing in the Talmud, right? they're not arguing about what the thing was. They're arguing what's pshat in posit about that thing. Stay carefully with me. It's a fantastic principle. That's a fantastic principle. The argument is, what does the Torah say about that thing? Not what was it historically. Again, we're dealing with Torah here. The Machlokes is a Machlokes in Torah. What does the Torah say about that thing? They're arguing Torah, not history. They're not arguing biology and medicine and archaeology and history. They've got nothing to do with the Talmud. The Gemara is arguing Torah. What does the Torah say about the tzitz? What does the Torah say about the Krashim? That's what they're arguing about. When they're arguing about the size of the Krashim, they weren't interested in how they look. That was not the discussion. That's history. That's archaeology. What does the Torah say when it talks about the Krashim? What is the size that's derived from the Psukim? That's what they're arguing. What does the Torah say about the tzitz? Does the Torah say it's like this or like that? They had an argument. Rebbe Yezer went to Rabbi and he saw it. They said, that's not relevant. Who cares what you saw? What you saw means simply that when B'Tzalel made the tzitz, he decided to make it this way. But the Torah could be read another way too. That's what we're arguing about. Very nice you saw it. Fine, good. That was his opinion. Fine. Now, you know, leave us alone. We're discussing... There's no machlekes in Matthias. The Torah does not argue, the Talmud does not argue factual, historical, medical, biological facts. It's not Torah. What they are arguing is Torah. What does the Torah say? Now, now, stay with me carefully. Every pasuk in the Torah can be read in 70 different ways. It says, Kepati Shefoy Tzetzela, like a hammer smashes a rock and the splinters go off in different directions. Actually, every, se- every one of the 70 has 70 others as well. But let's not get into that. Every, at the first basic level, there's 70 different ways that every pasuk can be understood. Which means that the Torah is a multi-potential... Do you understand what? It's a multi-potential created document. It's not a fixed... It doesn't work like that. <coughs> there's, there's a way... A base Hillel, for example, will learn every pasuk according to a certain methodology and a certain picture will emerge. Beis Shammah will learn all the pasuk in a different way and a whole different Torah will emerge. And it's all in the words. And it's all internally consistent. And it all uses the same principles of, of exegesis. When two sages come to argue, they're not arguing history. They're not interested in history. They're coming to argue, what does the Torah say about that fact? Right? Just, just let's think this through. Stay with me carefully. Why? Because they're learning Torah. The whole Indian of a Machlekes in Torah is, what does the Torah say about this thing? 
Rav Hutna goes a little further here. He says that in the Krashim of the Mishkan, the size of the Krashim in the Mishkan, you might think that at least they should be able to solve the halachic argument with reference to history. Because if they could show that the, the Mishkan was built with dimensions X and not dimensions Y, that's a very powerful argument. If Moshe Rabbeinu himself and Batsalal, if they paskan, if they ruled, if they learned the Pasuk a certain way, then surely the one who's arguing with the other one and can refer to the historical fact, he should surely say to him, well, your opinion's nice, but i got Moshe Rabbeinu on my side. Says Rav Hutner, that would be a very powerful argument. It doesn't mean that the other person's invalid, but surely it would sway the discussion if you could show, says Rav Hutner, in that particular argument they were unable to do it. You know why? With the, with the crushing of the Mishkan. You know why? Because, because the Mishkan was hidden. We don't have it anymore, right? The Besa Mikdash and the Kalim, the Besa Mikdash being the continuous Mishkan, is gone into what's called Geniza. There's been a Geniza, it's being hidden. See, what he's dealing with is the following question. When it comes to an argument that appears to have an application in fact, they're arguing the Torah of the size of the Krashim. However, it has an application in the world. There were Krashim that were built. Why don't you go and look at the size of the Krashim and use that in your argument? It would be very useful. Secondly, we know that they knew the factual aspects of the world. Anything that could be known about the world, they knew. Abai said that he knew the ways of the stars and the planets like the back of his hand. The Gemara's got derivations of the most abstruse and complicated... There's a question in the Gemara. One Roman came up to a ton and he said to him, how long is a snake pregnant? So he told him how long is a snake is pregnant. So he said, the Roman said to him, like, how do you know how long a snake is pregnant? You've got like one of these glass things in your back garden, you study them? He said, no, I looked in the Psukim. The Tana told him, derive the pregnancy duration of a snake from the verses. The verses say that, that Eve was, was cursed with pregnancy and the snake was cursed seven times as much and he brings a whole calculation and he works out. So the Roman went off and he checked and that's how long snakes are pregnant. Why? Because he was learning up the psukim. So you learn from this, but, but they knew the factual consequences in the world, either from the psukim or whatever, or, or from their insight into it. They knew what it was. So since they knew the factual aspects of the world, then why didn't they bring the factual knowledge to aid and amplify their halachic argument? Are you with me? Again, if they knew the facts in the world, right? They knew how the body looked. I mean, the Gemara says, for example, that they came to, I think, Rebbe Loza, Rebbe Leza, and they said to him, how many parts are there to the body? So he said, 248. 248 parts to the body. So they went off and they came back and they said, we dissected a human body. They found a Roman, somebody that the Romans executed. The students. They went and they Pasha dissected a human body. And they counted the organs. And they came back to Rebbe and they said to him, there's 252. He said to them, yes, you probably chose a woman. They said, yes. He said, sure, a woman's got four more parts to her body. What's the problem? But he knew how many parts there were to the body from the psukim. He never go into dissections. There's even a Gemara where they went and they did a certain dissection. And they came back and they said, look, you're wrong. He said to me, you bring me proof from the fools and I bring you proof from the Torah. What, what, where's your head? The Pasuk says the body looks a certain way. You go and do a dissection, you think that's proof? Who cares what the world looks like? What's the reality, the world or the Torah? Yeah, you give me a proof from the fools. That's how I said. You go, you go look in the world and you bring me a proof. That's called bringing a proof from the fools. If the Torah says it's like, it has to be like this. You made a mistake in the world. That's another problem. The question of witness dealing with is, if they had such an incredible knowledge of the world, why didn't they refer to the historical nature, size of the Krashim and include it in their argument? Says Rav Hutner, because just like we do not merit a revelation of the Mishkan that's gone into Geniza, we do not have the knowledge of the Mishkan either that's also gone into Geniza. We don't have the knowledge of the Torah of the Mishkan either. If in his history, historical terms, we don't have that structure, so in the mind of Torah, we don't have the knowledge of how that structure was either. And therefore, they couldn't even refer to the historical reality to add to their, to their halachic argument. And therefore, it was a pure halachic argument without any reference to history or archaeology. But that's an exception. That's a particular example of the, of the crushing. The general principle that you have to remember is any machlokes in Torah is a machlokes in what the Torah says about that thing. And they both write. The Pasuk says both of those things. The Pasuk says 70 of those things. They could have a 70-way argument and they'd all be right. The Pasukim lend themselves, do you understand? The Pasukim lend themselves to many, many different interpretations. And each one's bringing out a particular facet. And he's right. And he's arguing for his interpretation. Now, why does he bring out that one? And why does the other Tana bring out the other one? Because each one functions according to his Sherish Neshama. He's brought to the world with a unique contribution to make, and his uniqueness perceives in the Torah that unique resonance with his Neshama. You understand? Like the Moran Pika Abba says often, 
it says Bargalei Bepumei. It was a jewel in his mouth. That means it was the Torah that he characteristically used to say. This was the thing that you would hear from Rabbi Kiva. This was the thing that you'd hear. It tied in with his... Again, there's a very trafe explanation of this. You know that. I don't want to mention any names, but there's certain Jewish sources and colleges and, and certain Jewish uh, places that learn Torah from a, from a completely heretical perspective. And how do they do this? They say, oh, you know why this Tana has this opinion? Because he came from an agricultural area and so he saw the whole world through a farmer's eyes. And that's why he's always using those... In other words, he didn't have his own mind. His attitudes were formed, you understand, by his historical... He lived in the Roman times and he came from this and this and kind of thing and he was a, he was a shoemaker and his father was this and that and other. So like, that means he didn't have an opinion. He was just formed. Do you understand what... The, this is all part of that worldview that you're just the response to your environment and you don't have any... doesn't mean that. But there is a truth. There's a kernel of truth in it. In terms of who he was and his uniqueness, he brings... Why is Beis Shammai always taking the more stringent the more stringent and more exacting view? Why? Because their, their characteristic that they bring to the world is that facet of Torah that's called Gvura. Hillel is coming to the world to bring out that facet that's called Chesed. Between the two of them, says the Maral, the Torah is complete. And before Hillel and Shammai, there was an ability, three, four generations before, the whole Torah could be trans- transmitted by one man. For example, Shimon Atzadik. Right, Shimon Atzadik, Antignus. Those were people who were big enough to hold the Torah. After they became, the generations dropped, the Torah split into two facets. Beis Shammai brings the Chesed, bring the chesed bring, Hillel brings the Chesed side, Beis Shammai brings the Gevura side. Between the two of them, the whole Torah is complete again. Until finally it breaks down into more and more and more pieces. But no matter how far it breaks down, each individual sage is bringing out the facet of Torah that's uniquely the jewel that's a resonance with his personality. And together the whole Torah is complete. He knows that. He knows what it is that he's, that he's brought to the world. He knows what his unique insight is. And he's always bringing out that facet or that insight. So whenever you have a machlekes in a posuk, the one side is bringing out the beauty, that one of the 70 meanings that's the resonance with his unique personality that he's brought to the world to, br- to bring out. And the other one's bringing... Now, you know what this means? Just let me add one detail and stop for questions. Do you know what this means? First of all, are we, are we together? you see what I'm saying? You know what it means? If you have a machlekes and one tana brings out a certain facet, brings out a certain aspect, another one brings out another one, stay with me carefully. Once he's learnt a certain way, once he's brought out a certain meaning and he's learnt a certain way, he's learnt this, he's taken, of all the 70 meanings in this pasuk, he's brought out one. He's committed himself to the rest of the Torah. Because once you've learnt it this way here, you have to learn every other pasuk in the whole Torah consistent First of all, mechanically consistent. You can't hold that the Krashim are this size and then go learn something else that's a size that's inconsistent. The building won't fit together. <coughs> Once he learns the Krashim are a certain size, he's got to learn, but it's much deeper than that. Not only does he have to come out factually consistent, he's got to come out methodologically consistent too. The way that he chose to learn that verse to get that result, he's got to learn all the verses that way. If you interpret a verse in the Torah, if you take a verse and you hold, let's say that the, the internal logic is more important than the superficial meaning of the words, or whatever it is, right? Like Rashi and Toysus, very often Rashi takes the more simplistic, superficial, mechanical, rigid meaning of the words, and Toysus takes slightly more flexible use of the words, more consistent with, with the internal logic. And that's a theme that runs through Rashi and Toysus throughout. If a Tana takes a possum, and he chooses to learn a verse in a certain way where you emphasize a word in a certain way or you take a duplicated word and you extract a certain thing. He's committed himself. Every single example throughout the thousands and thousands of examples throughout the whole Torah, he's got to learn the same way. Do you know what it means? It means that every, every, every Tana sees the Torah in a completely different way and each one is learning, the, in other words. Have you ever seen those computer programs? They call cellular automata. Have you ever seen them? A cellular automata in a computer, they take a very small pattern and they give it a very simple set of defined rules. And according to those rules, it continues building the pattern. And, and the whole pattern that gets built very, very complex is always an expression of the same basic rules. Each tana in his mind has a slightly different set of rules spiritually. So as he learns the Torah, each one's Torah fans out to be an incredible structure which is all absolutely consistent and completely different from the next ones. And it's got to be consistent throughout. That means if if Reb Meir argues Reb Yekiva, right, and he learns a certain thing, then in some outlying Masechta that's miles and miles and miles removed, you can hold him accountable for a certain subtle methodological thing that he did here, 
Are you with me, gentlemen? It's, you know, you know, in the 1920s or 30s, whenever it was, there was a young bachur who faked. He forged a Yerushalmi. You know this? It was a young fellow. You know, you know, in the Yerushalmi, <coughs> we don't have certain tractates, certain masechtas. That we don't know if they never existed or we don't have them. There was a young fellow in the, in the yeshiva then who wrote a tractate of the Yerushalmi. Do you know what that means? Do you know what a genius he must have been? He wrote up. He wrote of his own mind a piece of Talmud Yerushalmi and he claimed that he found it in an old Geniza. That's a Jewish criminal, by the way. That, that's, a, that's a yeshiva type criminal. It is so good that very, very learned, very, very great people acknowledged it as an absolutely remarkable, totally uh, startling find. When the Rogach of Agon looked at it, he took one look at it and he said, this is a fake. So the guy admitted instantly and he said, he said say, but how did you know? Rogach said, because look, you say over here, Rebbe Meir says this and this and this. Rebbe Meir never could have said that. You, you have an opinion in the name of Rebbe Meir. The Rogach was so in the mind of Rebbe Meir from everything that he'd said all over the place, which is all perfectly consistent. He could never have held this opinion. That it wasn't consistent with everything else he'd said. That's right. It wasn't consistent with his methodology and view and insight and angle. Right? It was a slightly different color than all his other statements everywhere, which are all internally consistent. Instantly he said, this is not Rebbe And therefore, each tanner, you understand, had a program that ran differently throughout the thing. By the way, in the days of the Tanoim, every Tana had a different set of Mishnahs. You know that? Before Rebbe co- coordinated and codified the Mishnah that we have, every Tana had a slightly different set of Mishnahs. You know what Rashi writes? The Gemara says that, you know, you know, in those days, a boy used to learn Chumash from age 5 to age 10. From 10 to 15, he used to learn Mishnah by heart with the Rebbe. From age 15, he started learning Gemara. Today, we don't do it that way for certain reasons. There it says that from age 10 to age 15, while learning the Mishnah, he has to learn the whole period of all the Mishnah with only one Rebbe. He has to have only one teacher. Why? Because if he would learn half the Mishnah from one Tana, and then he would switch and learn the second half from another Tana, since they had different sets, he might miss a word in the first half that his Tana had in the second half, and then when he learns the second half from the other Tana, he might miss a word there that he had in the first half. And this kid would drop a halacha and he wouldn't know. Therefore, today doesn't apply, because today we want to have sta- one standardized set of Mishnahs, so you can be whoever you learned with. Today there's another reason from learning with one Rebbe only, until you've acquired a way of learning. Once you have a derech in learning and you know how to learn, you've got one style, right, and you know how to do that properly, then you can, once you've acquired a style, then you should become an eclectic and go and d- build your own style and become a unique individual. But you can't do that while you're being formed. But it's a much more subtle issue. In those days, right, you had to learn all the Mishnah for one run Rebbe. Because each one had his own version, he had his own set, but he was big enough to know that it was complete, that it had all halachas in the Torah. Yeah, any questions before? Yeah. Please, where regards to the sets, you said when this rock went to Rome, he came back, so we're not interested in the actuality. So it it's seems. It's a sort question. Well, you said Rav Fodman said, it's a pity we can't see what the question actually looked like, so no. what the difference? I presume what it means is that the one, one of them probably turned to the other one and he said, you see that Moshe and Betzalel Puskin this way. This is how they built the tits when they made the kalim. And I presume the other one was impressed by that. But he would continue arguing that the Pasuk still allows of this interpretation. And I'm simply bringing out that. He would have turned to him and said, that's Moshe Rabbeinu's opinion, but mine's different. So it's not. It's, yes, it doesn't make a difference how we see the crushing the actual sign because it, it, it's, it's the actuality, it's historical. Not I presume so. The, the difficulty is that Rav Hutner doesn't raise this thing about the tits. He talks about the crushing and that's what he says. Look it up yourself. It's in Lamed or Lamed Aleph in the last volume of letters. Someone writes him a letter and he answers with this, this basic idea. Yeah. Likewise, just like an Amara can't argue with the Tana. Yeah. How can an Amara argue with Moshe Rabbeinu? Or Betzana? I presume that comes into this discussion. I presume that's part of the decision. That means, I mean, an Amara can't argue with the Tana means not that he can't have his own opinion about about the fact that this could be a Pshat and Bosk. Rav Asman told us that an Amori can argue with the Tana. They just withheld themselves from doing so. Yes. Um, uh, like you'll find that Amori very seldom make droshas in Psukim. Very seldom you find an dr- original drosha from an Amori. You find it, but very seldom. They withheld themselves from doing that. They held that they were now at a stage where to make original droshas from Pasuk, that was the work of the Tana. They could, but they withheld themselves. Yeah. You said in the time of the Shimon Sodeh and the um, they, they could be transmitted by one person. Yes. <coughs> if you do it later, it would be a... Um, That's right. The Maral says that. So, um, 
It seems strange that when it should split in two with uh, Hillel and Shammah, yeah. that um, we should pick one. Well, why don't we, we don't pick one. Well, we'll They're both valid. We'll 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 no, we'll let's get. Oh, well, let's get this clear. When Beis Hillel and Beis Shammah come along and they argue two different points of view, right? They're both Torah. We can't rule according to two opposite opinions in practical halacha. Listen, listen, listen. They're both Torah, they're both 100% valid. They're both 100% valid. When the later generations have to choose which one we will live by, we have to make a decision. Now, why do we choose to rule according to Beis Hillel for our generation is a question. You want to know the answer? It's basically because we cannot live up to the standard of Beis Shammah. There are opinions who say that when the Mashiach comes, we will leave Beis Hillel and we'll live according to Beis Shammah. It's a higher opinion, but it's too stringent. Isn't it just like um, symbolic of like, the two different middle, which they... Uh, yeah, it's, it's not symbolic. It's not, it's not like, uh, you know, when the Mashiach comes, we, we, we don't need to uh, go by Beis Hillel. I don't follow you. You want the, the Gemara says the reason we pass on like Beis Hillel is because they were humbler and they put the words of Beis Shammai first. Since they put their words first and they were so humble, we rule according to them. That's what it says. Right? Many people explain that for our generations we need the leniency dimension of Beis Hillel. You know. But uh, if we were capable, we could live on the stringency of Beis Shammai. And there's a depth to that as well. Are you with me? It's not a who's right and who's wrong. They're both completely valid. It's by Hillel and Shammai that the Gemara says, Elu elu Dibra Chaim. It's Dafka by them that it says these are both words of Hashem. Why? Because the Psukim in the Torah contain both of those dimensions. Can this be compared by Hasidus and Hasidim and Midnachtim as to Midnach a Chassid must be a Chassid in everything he does and Yeshiv Shagai must be a Midnachtim in everything that he does in both rights sure definitely they both have potential to be taken beyond as has happened but the time has proved that they're both um have the Kedusha of being part of Klal Yisrael, of course. Sfaradim and Ashkenazim in certain ways have got different. Sure, they all make the 12 tribes, are all different, but they all harmonize to make one whole. Yeah. So the way you just put it, um, answering, sorry, that, that, that guy's um, question was that there's two different dimensions, yeah. right? Right, according to two different opinions. Mm-hmm. So okay, I can understand that with certain laws, but when you've got a physical building, you've got a physical thing. They're not arguing about the physical building. That's the point. They were not arguing the about the, the They were not arguing about that. They were arguing what does the pasuk say should right. be the measurement measurements. Right, but but you would at the end get two separate buildings. That's right. And if one of them were allowed to build the Mishkan, it would look one way. And if the other one were the one in charge, it would look another way. Do you know that it says that Moshe and Bitzalot had a big argument about how to build the Mishkan and the Kali? There was a big argument. And it was built according to Bitzalot's opinion. For example, Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to build the Kalim first and then the Mishkan later. And Bitzalot wanted to build the, the, the Mishkan first and then the Kalim. And that's how we that's how was taking place. He overruled yeah, his... There were two different ways to do it. And that reflects by Silon and by Shaman. Yes. What about the tabernacle? I'm sorry. What about it? The tabernacle, Hashem helped Moshe build it. He erected it, yeah. Right, so does anyone question how that was built? That was miraculous, how he actually put it up in the end. But the pieces had been made by the Jewish people. Yeah. Is there an implication then that... Um, with regard to your example of the snake and the pregnancy, yeah. is there an implication that another rabbi from another school having been asked the same question, right. could give a different answer, and it would also have been true in the physical world. Why do we have to say that? Since snakes have one type of pregnancy, mm-hmm. they all would have been able to derive that same fact from Why would you... Well, so for example, he didn't... There's know, a more subtle... Right, the rabbi had never investigated the pregnancy of snakes, and yes. it was something he'd studied. Yes. The question came but you're making a mistake. If there's one reality in the world, mm-hmm. and what he's trying to give the Roman is an answer for the reality, how many parts the human body has, how long a snake is pregnant, mm-hmm. then the psukim are going to give him the right answer. When he's learning Torah, and, and the reality is not the point, yes, which is not dealing with snakes' pregnancies or parts of the human body, he's dealing with what the, what the holy pshat in Pasuk is about a mishkan, then the psukim will have 70 different applications. Yeah. Each time has his own day of learning, and he needs, and from that day, he has to derive the whole Torah. How can we have a compilation of different tongues? When do we have a compilation of the Mishnah? It's not. It's all Rebbe's. That's exactly the so point. That, that's his day of learning. Yes. Rebbe was great enough to fix for all time till the Mashiach comes the particular version that we need that takes us through the Golas. And the rest he left out in the Bryces and, and other things. He codified and edited the set that we need. Yes, sure. We all use now Rebbe's set. Yeah. <coughs> The Mishnah is just an example. It's not a derech in learning. Whether you choose this set or that set, I'm just giving you an example. 
We're not choose, that, that's, that's not like a ton of learning how to learn a basuk a certain way. That's already a question of his own, do you understand? It's much more deeply a question of his own inner expression. And you know, the Gemara, it talks about how much various kind of events it many years but uh, two people are, you know, halakha, one, one, the wrong is one way, and another guy says, uh, if the halakha is like me, I could have turned back. And then a bus call comes down, yeah. and says, I look like him, and in the end, he's still going to ask about the bus call. Right. What about that? That's because the Torah is not in Shemaim. So the Torah has given us instructions that we are the possessors of Torah, and therefore they ruled according to the majority, which is the Torah said, even though a voice came out like Rabbi Eliezer, they ruled like Rabbi Yeshua, because the majority was on his side. If a prophet would walk in and tell us what the Allah would be, the Rambam says he's killed as a false prophet, because the Allah has got nothing to do with prophecy. The Allah is the way the rules of Torah apply in the world to the consciousness of the sage. By the way, this is one of the reasons that women don't learn Gemara. Because when a man learns Gemara, he has to get to the end result of the conclusion together with his own consciousness. Do you understand? There's part of his own opinion that's put in. The remarkable thing. The grasp that he has to have at the end of the day when he's fathomed the sugya deeply enough is a personal grasp that is totally objective and yet it includes his own opinion and consciousness. And that's not a woman's function. That's not her role. She has a different way of accepting things. Remarkable thing. The oral law by its nature is involving the one who transmits it. Incredible idea, but it's our, it's our share in Torah. We're not just trying to learn it objectively like a library. We don't want to become like a tape recorder and a obje- you know, total repository of information. No. We want to learn Torah together with the formation of the vessel that learns it, and there's a harmony between the opinion that goes in and the person who holds that opinion. Incredible. And that's why two Tanaim can come out, two different opinions, and both be right. Because each one's, you understand, a reflection of what he uniquely is in Torah. Because Torah is the Jewish people. And yet you would say that with Moshe Rabbeinu, he was greater than the other one of the other because he was objective. more translucent, more yes. objective. And despite that, it says he was from Beishamah. Do you know that? Despite that, it says he was from the side of Beishamah. And Betzalah was from Beishilal, and that's why they argued. Some use that to illustrate that Beishamah is the higher dimension. It's the side of Din. And Moshe Rabbeinu was up there. He couldn't relate to things. He couldn't relate to Rabbi Torah. He couldn't even understand what it meant. He was mamash holding on that level. Do you understand what's going on? Do you know what the Rizal says? I mean, this is mind-boggling. It says that Moshe Benner went up to Shemaim to get the Torah, right? So, so he found Hashem tying crowns to the letters, right? He found Hashem putting the, the, the Ksarim on the Osiris. So Hashem said to him, so Moshe Benner said to Hashem, he asked him, a, so Hashem said to him, you don't, greet, you don't greet people where you come from. You don't say Shalom. So Moshe said, I thought that the Rebbe should greet the Talmud first. I didn't... Moshe is having a machlekes with Hashem. He stands there in total silence. Hashem says to him, why don't you say Shalom? People don't greet people where you come from. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, the way I learned was that the Rebbe first greets the Talmud. It's a chutzpah for the Talmud to greet the Rebbe. So Hashem said, Haya lecha Ozraini. You should have helped me. Haya lecha Ozraini. You should have helped me. You should have helped me. In other words, you should have opened... Do you know the Machlekes? Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, listen carefully, Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, I thought that the Rebbe speaks first, it comes down from the top. You know whose opinion that is? Beishamai. Beishamai say eight candles and we go down to one. And Hashem was saying, Haya Lecha Lo Zreni. You know what that result says? Haya Lecha Lo Zreni is the letters of Hillel. Haya Lecha Lo Zreni. Oh, it says Hillel. You know what the argument was up there? Moshe Rabbeinu was expressing the side of Beishamai because he was from the side of Beishamai and Hashem was expressing the side of Beishil. Do you know what's going on? And that's how the Torah was given. Anyway, I don't want to go into it now. I have a tape in the library that's called Rebbe, I think the tape is called Hillel and Shammai, Right and Left Hands. Get that tape if you're interested in the subject. Uh, there are two versions. One is called Hillel and Shammai, One is called Hila and Shammai Left and Right Hands, Advanced, which is more for people who've got a Yeshiva background, a Torah background. If I once gave a share on that budget. If we have two various opinions, yeah. that's right. Then so why can't we today decide which opinion we do? We do. We do. We do. How do we rule today? We do. The great sages of each generation rule which is the one that's appropriate for us. If what you mean is why don't you decide and him and him and him, sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. You have to know what the rules of Torah say. Sometimes there's a majority in your generation that fixes it. After we come along and decide that from now till Mashiach we rule like Beis Hillel, you're no longer free. You know why? Because somebody much greater than you 
in a majority, according to Torah opinion, has ruled that from now on, we hold like we're sinal. Sometimes in Allah there's room to take the minority view. Sometimes in extreme circumstances, the minority does come up. You have to know there's rules, yes. So, to, to go on what I was saying about Dr. I understand that we keep halakha because we believe it to be the will of God, that we do this thing. You know, we but the will of God is that your opinion gets involved in his opinion. And sometimes his will is that you can outvote him. But it's not directly today's subject, if you don't mind. Right. What? The Lord comes down and says, right. you know, which is from says, the will of God is that you do the halakha right. like this. But the will of God has already been expressed as being that which the majority rules. And therefore, Why prophet... Is another Bible? There's a good question. And it would seem to be to indicate... <coughs> and to vindicate Rabbi Eliezer, first of all, and to show that objectively there's no harm in showing that from an absolute perspective that's his opinion. But, but he's also previously told us that what I want more than my objective opinion is your subjective opinion, which is valid Torah. That's what I want. Do you know says that afterwards they saw Hashem, Elio came down and they asked him, and he said, Hashem was smiling at that time and saying, my children have defeated me. Okay, that's not our subject directly. Okay, now before people start throwing things, let's learn a bit of text. <laughs> but it's a fundamental point. I'd look it up in, in Rav Putner. This is what it means that Hashem created man in his image, in the image of Hashem, of Elokim. He's, he's emphasizing the name Elokim. Just as Hashem is Elohim, which means Bala the definition of the name, the Pshat in the word Elohim, is the possessor, the power behind all the energies in the creation and above all the worlds. That's the name, the meaning of the name Elohim, right? Not the name Hashem. The name Elohim means the one who is the power behind all the energies in creation. <laughs> Just like he organizes and conducts all of the energies that are taking place throughout all the worlds, at every moment the, the way he wants them, that similarly he put the human being in a position where he is the one who opens and closes all the hundreds of thousands of energies and forces and worlds. I'll be called Prate Sidra Nagosa by means of all the details of all the systems of his actions, but call in Yonov in all his matters, but call Ace Varega Mamash every instant and every moment, literally. Kefishosha Elion shall mass of a Dibro Mashawesa. According to the superior source, the root, if you like, of all his actions, words, and thoughts. Keilu Hu Gam Ken Apal Kershalam Kibyochal. As if he too was the possessor or the master. Of all these energies. What he's saying is, beautiful, beautiful pshat. Why does it say Tselem Elohim? Why doesn't it say Tselem Hashem? Why doesn't it say the image of Hashem and his name of essence? Why does it say the image of Hashem and his name of Elohim? Again, Janice said, what he's faced with here is, why does it say the Tselem Elohim? Why does it not say Tselem, some other name of Hashem? And he explains as follows. The Elohim name means Hashem's conduct of the world. So B'Tselem Elohim means that you made in the image of the one who controls the world. Which means that all your actions and all your thoughts and all your speech is controlling the world. That's what it means. That's what's being indicated. It doesn't mean you look like him in his, in his, in his point of origin. Right? Not, not relating to that now. We learn to the fact that as Hashem masters and controls and organizes all the energies and, and conduct of the world, you create it in the image of that controlling energy. So the Tselemon Kim means that the human being, among many other meanings, is connected up to all the, all, the, all the control switches and control lines, right, in all the higher worlds and the lower worlds. And by every action that you do down here, you are going up to the source of that thing and you're making a change to the whole system, right? In a sense, just like the Shem Elohim is that which controls and organizes and conducts everything that happens, so too everything that you do is controlling everything that happens in the world. Va'amruzal, ba'echer abasi, and that's why they have said in the Medrash, va'yelchu b'loichayach, that they walked without any power. Rabbi Kiva b'shem, this is not Rabbi Kiva, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. If you look it up, it is Rabbi... Rabbi Azaria, I think it is over there. B'shem Rabbi Yeshua ben Sisma over there. Omer, 
Bizman Shisrael is in return of Shalmakim, the time when the Jewish people are doing what Hashem wants, Moisifin Koyach Bigvur Shalmala. They add to the strength of Hashem's Kivyokul, Hashem's power. In other words, we give him power. Kamad at Amat, like it says, Belokim Nas Echayel. In the Shem Elokim has been added or made energy, power. Right? These are very dangerous ideas. You have to be very careful how you say these things. It says that we, Kivyokul, are influencing Hashem, we're giving him power that he didn't have before. Right? And at times when the Jewish people are not doing what Hashem wants, we weaken the power of that which is above. We Kivyochal weaken Hashem. Like it says, through Teshi, you have weakened the rock of your foundation. In other words, the, the rock that gave you birth, Tsur is always a reference to Tsur literally means a rock, but its deeper meaning is Sayar. Sayar means the former, the one who forms or creates, right? Tzur means a rock, literally, but it's the same root in Hebrew as Latzur in Hebrew means to form. What? Sayar is an artist or one who shapes or forms things, right? Tzur Yelodcha, the point of origin that has given birth to you, you have weakened. You have to be very, very careful the way you say these things, right? If you walk out into the street and tell people that we strengthen God or we weaken God, right, they'll, they'll either think you're raving or they'll think you've converted. We don't have to be very careful. We don't. It doesn't mean that. It means, deeply understood, it means that the way he conducts the world, right? The shame Elohim that conducts the world, we give that more power. But by our actions, we enable him to conduct it more according to the way it should be. At all. We become a Mekoymus Bazaar, and the style of the Nefesh Chaim is, as you should have realized by now, he says an idea. He brings sources for it, and then he brings the sources usually in the Zohar, right? He brings the, the Zohar, which talks literally about these things. He brings a quotation from the Zohar that illustrates his point. Right? It's about the last place these days in the yeshiva world that you can actually quote Kabbalah and not be thrown out, right? If you quote it on the Evesh they're still, still acceptable. <coughs> The Zohar says, "The Chayve Barnash, that the sins of human beings, Avdin Pegimul Ela, are causing a defect in the higher worlds. V'chein Lehefech Kanal, and similarly the reverse, as we have said before. V'zeh Shomer Akosov, and this is what the verse means when it says, Tnu Oiz Lelokim, give power to Elokim. Right? Again, it does not mean Chas V'Shalom to him himself." It means to his ability or his channel of energy that comes into the world. That's what it means. Again, make no mistake. Shem Elokim means Hashem coming into and operating and energizing and conducting the world. That you can improve and that you can damage. Is this clear, gentlemen? We, nobody's saying that you weaken Chas V'Shalom Hashem or you strengthen Hashem. Chas V'Shalom. We're not talking about that. We're talking about his name of bringing his conduct into the world. That you can strengthen so that he, he comes in more and that the world has more light. Or you can darken it and keep him out. You're not Chas V'Shalom affecting him, as he's going to explain in very, very great detail later. But you are affecting his interaction with the world, because that's in our power. You mentioned before that uh, if a person wants to do a good deed, like the, is this the same force that he affects that somebody else might think, oh, I'll put a pin on today. Is that sure. the same force that we're talking about? Yes, because when you do something right, you bring more glow into the world, and other people could pick that up too, and it could give them an advantage, yes. And especially the Jewish people. When you do something right... You help all of us. And when you do something wrong, I have a claim against you because you brought me down. You brought me down. That's because we one organic entity. When the Jewish people sinned at the golden calf, Hashem said to Moshe, Lech reid kishich samcha, you go down. Because your people have sinned. You go down? What did, I, what did he have to do with it? He's the head of the body. When the body goes down, the head goes down. Yeah? If you step your feet from one step to a lower step, all of you goes down. Ah, your head didn't take the step. You're one organic Entity. The Jewish people is like that. When the lowest go down, the highest go down. When the highest go down, the lowest go down. When the highest goes up, they schlep everybody up. If a Jew is sinning today in Paris, you're in trouble. And in fact, you have a claim against him because he's weakening the whole situation and he's giving you, putting you in danger. He's putting you in danger today. If, if, you're, if, if your one hand bleeds, your whole body's in trouble. If your one hand bleeds badly enough, it happens in London too. Don't look at him. <laughs> <laughs> if your one hand bleeds badly enough, the rest of you is bleeding too. You can't say, well, it's only that hand. It's connected, right? You may not know your connection with me, but as the Jewish people, and in a more large sense, the whole universe, but especially the Jewish people, we're one organic entity. When one piece bleeds, the whole, pe- the whole thing's bleeding. Yeah. And, but, 
And, and that depends on the law mitzvahs or, or, or various things. Yeah. But if the Kodesh work is infinite, yeah. then surely even if we all do massive verse, he can still come into the world more than... He could, but he sets up the system in such a way that he makes us the talent. And on our backs rides his interaction with the world. That's how he set the system up. Later he's going to go into details of the anatomy of how it looks and why it is this way and all its connections. But the principle is that he set the world up in such a way that he put us in charge of the way it runs and he brings himself into it more riding on our backs or he keeps himself out of it when we don't know him in. That is our control over the world. We're not just puppets over here. Isn't there a notion that by your actions and your words and by your thoughts you create malarim? Yeah. Malarim of, ta- of Tuma and Malarim of Tara. Right. This malarim creates a filter. Right. 100%. Right. What, more, what can we give more power to to, to this um, to this power that Hashem brings in the world to physically go and do a chesed yeah. or to sit and, and learn Torah oh that's an excellent question excellent question he's going to go into this more but I'll just say this when you do a mitzvah that's physical you bring energies down into the world that aid that department when you learn Torah you bring energy into the world that aids that department which one is higher objectively learning Torah is the greatest which one objectively is more if you could choose to go do certain mitzvahs or you could choose to learn Torah learning Torah is the, is the, the lifeline right, that brings everything in that's far more important than anything else now that depends Th- that's the general concept but depends sometimes you have to close the books and go do a mitzvah some individuals are more suited for doing chesed in the world and, and manifesting their personalities that way that's what they should be doing other people are more gifted in being able to learn purely there's a lot of individual variation here of where each person... The, the answer to your question from the depth is, who are you? Are you part of the brain cells? Are you part of the fingers? Are you part of the feet? What are you? Yeah, each part of the body has to be doing what it has to be doing. If the fingers are trying to do what the feet are doing, you're in trouble. If the brain cells are trying... The beauty of the Jewish people is that you have to find out where you fit. If your part is more in mitzvahs, right, or more in earning a living and using it correctly, etc., etc., then that's what you have to be doing, and you'd be failing if you did something else. But if someone else's part is in the base medrash and he's be'ika, able to learn Torah primarily and he's out there doing something else, then right? where there's a freedom of choice, freedom of latitude, a person should rather choose Torah. But where he knows Alpida's Torah that he should be doing this or that or the other thing, then he should be doing that thing. You know about the, 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 so the fellow was sitting in his shiva and he was learning and he happened to look out the window and he saw someone drowning. Now, you know, it says that Talmud Torah is connected Kulam, but bigger than saving lives. Torah is greater than saving lives. It doesn't mean that if someone's life needs to be saved, then you learning, you ignore it. If someone's life needs to be saved, then it has to be done now and only you can do it, you close the book. But it means in an absolute sense, if you could have had a choice whether to be the one to save that life or let someone else do it and be learning Torah, Torah is better. Anyway, saw this fellow drowning, so he ran down the stairs, flew out, dived into the lake and saved his life. When he got back, his Rosh Hashiva said to him, Shakech, but why were you looking out the window? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>